Up next, we have a very nice speaker, very interesting person. Jerome Foster II is an environmental justice advocate who creates social and environmental change through art, technology, and policy. He is currently the co-founder of Wake Up, which is running a campaign called One Million of Us to get one million young people to register to vote in the upcoming 2024 elections. He also advises the Biden presidency on environmental justice and issues affecting the health and well-being of people and the natural environment. Welcome, Jerome. Over to you. Thank you all for having me here to speak at the Energy Tech Summit. And I want to start by addressing, if it's not already the elephant in the room, will soon be the elephant in the room in every room around the world. And that term is environmental justice. Typically, when we think about the environment, we think about it as uh, plants and animals, flora and fauna, and thinking about it as nature in an abstract way. But environmental justice instead looks at both where we live, where we play, where we interact with our children and thinks about how we encompass and how we are a part of nature. And at its core, understand that human beings are inseparable from the idea of nature and people and planet. And I want to dig deeper into that notion because thinking about the world in that way allows us to make certain considerations and it allows us to understand that injustice exists in many intersections and many nuances. A classic example is, is in the U.S., you can see that 78% of African Americans are placed, are living within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant. But African Americans only make up 14% of the U.S. population. That is environmental justice. That is, I mean, that is environmental racism. And it's a classic example of understanding how decades of, of disproportionate, um, and disproportionate policies against African-American people continue to worsen and continue to degrade our intersections and a solution to the climate crisis. I want to take a step back and just start from understanding how we got to where we are today. I think when thinking about the climate crisis, everyone here is kind of working within the headspace of technology and engineering and development and had that science and STEM brain. And I think that's brilliant in that sense. But there's also another side of the coin, and that's culture, and that's also justice. Thinking about that side of the coin, we think about how do we not only solve the climate crisis from the perspective of the future, but the perspective of the past and the present. Because if we only think about solutions that continue to decarbonize and electrify our, electrify our communities, then we don't think about the history and the legacy of the burdens that communities on the front lines of climate crisis are already feeling right now. For example, Ascension Paris in Louisiana is currently having conversations where the state wants to have primacy to be able to, to enact as much carbon sequestration projects in that community. And when you think about it, that sounds like a great, a great like, a kind of ramping up of solutions. But when you dig deeper, you understand that when the project that they're proposing we're only thinking about carbon essentialism, where they're stripping carbon out of the air, but they aren't thinking about co-pollutants. They aren't thinking about how will the methane be sequestered? How will there will be PM2.5 particulate matters be, um, be sequestered? And all those things that go beyond just CO2 is a part of environmental justice. I think that's what's really important is to think about, and think about how are communities going to be able to not only, not only be a part of the solution, but to be a part of the organizations that are, a part of the, that are building these projects. And when I was invited to join the, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, I was a young person, I was 18 years old, and they said, we want someone who is willing to basically speak up and tell the truth about the climate crisis, and for us to have these frontline communities finally have a voice in the project that will imp imp impact us. And one of the biggest things that we saw was that there's oftentimes a rock and a hard place because our current society is a society in which every project has quick turnarounds. It has to be the cheapest possible. It has to be the fastest possible. And then often disregards aspects of equity because they say, oh, it's, it's either perfection, perfectionism and we disregard all aspects of equity or it's momentum. And it's not an either or. It's about a balance between both because before there was a system before capitalism, in which we thought about in every t action that we took daily, how we impacted the world around us. But today, we only think about what we take from the environment, and we think about how we price that, and we think about how we can sell that to someone else for a larger profit. 
but we don't think about how does that impact the communities where it's being manufactured, how does that impact the waste for the communities in Indonesia and communities all across Asia that are being impacted by the trash that we create from our products. Capitalism doesn't care about that. It renders it an externality. And that's the transition we need to make. It's thinking about how do we change the way in which we think about companies? How do we change the way in which we think about how do we conceptualize this massive problem, which is climate change, and think about it from a holistic perspective and not just a math problem? Because then we get to issues where this IPCC report says carbon, carbon sequestration is a must and that we must, we, it, is a, it is something that we need to do within the next decade for us to be able to reach our carbon goals. But it neglects the fact that there are communities across the U.S. where if a flood hits them, then it's not just flood water. It's the uranium that was built 70 years ago, which was never, never capped. So now it's toxic water that's flooding that community. And it doesn't the IPC doesn't take into account co-pollutants. And I think that, is, that, that shift that we think about is widening our perspective and widening our horizons to understand that profit isn't the only motive that community should be our number one motive. And that comes from restructuring a way in which you think about democracy as not just something that's in government, but something that's within our organizations. Economic democracy, in a sense. And how do we empower workers to feel like they're a part of the solution and that their communities are involved in the projects and that they have consent on whether they can say yes or no? That's not a part of our STEM models, but it should be. That's what the talk about today is. is thinking about how do we make sure that young people are part of the conversation. Because one of the, one of the biggest things that happened in, in, in the White House Council is that we're thinking about another example of long-term solutions. How do we store nuclear waste in a way that's effective? And one of the biggest issues was that a lot of the other White House members, they're incredible people, they're amazing people, but they, didn't, they weren't young. They were in 50s, 60s, 70s, had PhDs, and they had written research studies. But me as a 21-year-old right now was understanding, well, how will that impact 40 years from now? Because you're only thinking about 15 years for this life cycle. You're only thinking about how do we have the next year in which we have companies' in incentives. But as a young person, I'm going to be alive maybe into 2100. And those are the solutions, we, that's how long term we have to think. They think about our children's children and think about those children after that. And that's what's so intersectional about the climate crisis and why we need more diverse voices, not just in government, but in corporations. And one thing I want to touch on is, there's been so much talk about how do we make sure that we kind of know about and involve communities at the local level. But one of the biggest struggles I've seen so far is in data. And a lot of the policy recommendations and in, 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 in convincing companies to do like environmental justice work in communities, it's like, where's the proof? Where's the proof that they are disadvantaged? Are they disadvantaged? Uh, where, where, where is that kind of research from decades past? And a lot of it is because, a lot of the missing data is because of the fact that we aren't making it or collecting it in the first place. And that is one push I'll plead for everyone here is to, Re create those initiatives and create those, those programs in which wealthy white communities oftentimes have the data to be able to get the incentives and to be able to get the tax credits. But black and brown communities that are 78% living within coal-fired power plants don't have that data. So they're left for 70, 80 years without any solutions because, well, they're invisible if there's no data, according to our current economic and political models. That's a big ask for everyone here. It's to take that away and say, hey, how do we, irregardless of the fact that there's data dark zone, why don't we have some ground truthing projects in which we send out some employees to work with communities, have true community engagement, in which you understand where they're coming from and create real solutions. And I think in thinking about the way in which we, we organize ourselves in society today, there's often an understanding of a sense in which, it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but I think, when it comes down to the fact that being rooted in change means that it's about tackling the past, it's also about tackling the present. It's about thinking, how do we mobilize people now? And oftentimes I see corporate campaigns thinking about awareness. How do we get more people involved? How are you convincing young people to get out in the streets? And the answer is we've done that. It's been done. Young people, people around the world know what climate change is. They may not know the nuances, but they're looking to you for the nuances. They're looking for you to be the leaders that are creating those solutions. 
And the next step has to be from those existing commitments in reaction to us mobilizing young people is making yearly accountability, yearly, account, yearly updates on those, on those promises. And all the existing commitments can't just be in which we're saying, okay, we said we're gonna go carbon neutral by 2040, we're done. Okay, we can go home now, guys. It, it, it's like thinking about, well, what's gonna happen in 2024? What's gonna happen in 2025? What's gonna happen in 2026? How do we make sure people know what's happening? Because even though they might not know the nuances, they know that something has to be done and that change must happen. And that if, it, if it's not happening in the pace that it needs to be, then be honest about that. Because oftentimes co companies are scared to say, oh, well, we didn't reach our commitments. That's why we're not doing year over year announcements. But that allows you opportunity for you to connect with the movement. Because young people, our, our narrative has been told in the media that it's oftentimes old people versus young people, but it's old people versus fossil fuel executives, which are oftentimes old. <laughs> and that's the road to me. It, it, it's not just every young person hates old people. We're wanting to be a part of the discussion. We're wanting to be a part of these boards. We're wanting to be a part of these, these campaigns which are reaching out and educating people that want to be educated. And I think that is the shift that we have to take is by including us in a really meaningful way and not just creating announcements and campaigns, but making sure that it reaches communities so they can be a part of it. Because there's multiple cases where New York, New York, New Jersey right now, they are having issues in which new companies are coming in and trying to propose more projects. And they are completely unaware of the fact that there are many, many um, companies that are coming in with campaigns that are ready for, to replace fossil fuels. And that all they have to do is to sign a petition and get it on the ballot and then vote on it. That's the kind of education campaigns we need is for us to be on the ground, not just, or, not just NGOs, but companies taking that next step. Understand that your role in society isn't just to create profit and endless economic growth, but to use the analogy of a tree. And we understand our society as one day we planted ourselves in the ground and we rooted ourselves and said, okay, we're gonna grow. We're gonna grow as high as possible. But at some point that tree matures and it grows up and it understands that at some point we have to stop growing. At some point, we have to start developing and make sure all our branches, all our roots, all, all our leaves have equal and equitable access to the nutrients that we're getting and not have one branch be super strong and then this branch will be like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> and then that's kind of the change that has to happen is, 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 is thinking about it from a holistic perspective and advancing from growth to development. If you take nothing else from this talk, I want everyone to understand that we have 10 years before we start reaching irreversible tipping points to top the climate crisis. And I know we all understand the urgency, we all think we, we know the science, but right now there are floods in Libya where they're expected 2,000 people to have died. In, many, in Minnesota in the United States, 90% of the state is considered in drought conditions. Right now there are countless communities which are being reeled by the climate crisis because of our un inability to get uncomfortable and for us to stand up and say enough is enough. Every single one of us had the ability to transform our organizations. I was just a little kid watching a documentary and said, I'm gonna start protesting in front of the White House. And then I, start, I started being an advisor. Imagine all of us in this room using that same compassion, using that same empathy, and using that same courage to stand up and say, we're gonna just go beyond just what people think is possible and what projections think we can do and step into our essence and understand that we are the movement. And that a movement is not just for young people, it's for old people, it's for adults, it's for young adults, it's for every single, under, every single person in this room to say, hey, we're gonna go out in the march on September 17th. And if, if I can't do that, I'm gonna march within my company and say, hey, this is what we're gonna do. Or we're gonna go on strike. And those are the levers of change in which we can pull and those are the actions which we can take. I think going into this next decade, into, into 2030, will be a really telling moment in which we understand that Gen Z is understanding intersectionality as a moment in which we connect from the past, connect from the future, connect in the present. And we see communities that used to be sites of slave plantations now at the forefront of the climate crisis. And those overlaps are so, so concrete that it says, why are we not why are we not taking this thread of, of the history of injustice and using this as a moment in which we can go back and not just decarbonize and electrify, but to rethink about how our systems work and how they work together. 
Because if a company only creates a water bottle and says, that's all we do, we create water bottles, then you don't think about the waste that you produce. You don't think about the companies you can partner with to create kind of unions of, of, of organizations in which you think about waste as another input. And that it's not just a line, but it's a circle. And think about it in a meaningful way, and not just in a tongue-in-cheek way, because oftentimes there's loud speech but little action. And that's what has to change. And I think it, it, it's, it's just that next step that we have to take. And I'm super excited to have been able to speak here. And one thing that a lot of young people wanted me to say here is that, that we are, are urging each and one of you to engage with us on more ways than just in commercials and in public statements or in press releases, but to sit down with us as consultants and to sit down with us as constituents and to sit down with us as community members and say, hey, we're going to listen to you and we're going to listen to what you believe should happen and we're going to take actionable steps from it. Thank you.